being here at the uh, theology school is the only place I could find in academia where I could get my doctorate in um, looking at religious practice at the transformative kind of level uh, mm -hmm. internally. So almost like a subjective experience and um, actually now having been in like the three year solitary retreat is for Tibetan contemplative practice in Vajrayana Buddhism. And because I trained as a physicist and had done neuroscience coursework also, like graduate level coursework, when I finished, before I was finishing my um, previous studies many years ago, then while I was in the retreat, I kind of wished I had like a respiration monitor with me so that I could see kind of objectively or cumulatively how the breath rate and EEG would develop over time of the practice because it's in a very controlled condition. Mm -hmm. And then coming out of the retreat and like all my, this is so basically a 10 year period in Mount Everest National Park in Nepal is where I stayed. Mm -hmm. And um, in that I have, um, you know, some kind of slides online that you can use <laughs> to uh, see how that was there. I have a kind of a slideshow that I have up on the internet okay. webpage. I should give you the um, details for how to look that up. And um, so anyway, you can see there, I basically had three different places. Um, three different places of where I stayed in the Mount Everest National Park. And um, so then at the end of that, my benefactors for my retreat, anyway, the budget was very low. It was about $1,200 a year. Okay, so that was like the full budget. So that's why I was there and as opposed to other places. That was the primary reason because I didn't have resources to try to do that here. Mm -hmm. Is even if you go to a retreat place, you still the cost of living is higher, even at a very low level right. <laughs> of subsistence. <laughs> so um, then, coming towards the end of that period, then I'm thinking, oh, well, I would if I'm going to be teaching more, then also I'd want more information about how my students are doing with their meditation practice and for teaching too. So that has gotten me interested in developing like assessment protocols that I could use alongside the traditional ones because in these practices they are very formal. They follow kind of almost like a standardized form even though it's a pre-modern, actually like an ancient kind of conception right. of the standards, but they are standards of their own sort. Um, and then... Um, so that would be useful for teachers and students of these practices to have more information about the processes of what's going on while um, it's going on and then also longer term outcomes. So mm -hmm. if someone joins some meditation group then 20 years later, you know, what's happened. Uh, not, you can't control for every other thing in life but compared to themselves, you know, right. so at a, or like an intrapersonal development. So that's the kind of thing that I want to actually do, which is basically write out my conception um, from a personal experience of kind of the psychodynamics of the process of going through this kind of meditation training. And, um, you know, bring in the scriptural resources and primary text to kind of support that, although historically I think it's always been the other way around, you know, starting from the scriptural <laughs> text and then rationalizing the practice. Right. Um, but in a way it's kind of uh, interesting hermeneutic to do it the other <laughs> way. It's kind of a contemporary idea maybe of like the living document, right? Yeah. Scripture as a living, lived experience kind of thing. Uh, of course then there's the feminist component and so grafting that on, I mean, I tried actually finding where I could do this kind of thing in American academia, especially mm -hmm. since I'm from North America, and basically being completely broke otherwise, you know, coming back in, uh, well, just even coming out of retreat and where is I going to go, 
uh, living basically in the poverty level, like three dollars a day for. I mean, I was in Asia 20 years altogether, so no capital resources mm -hmm. whatsoever to speak of. So the only thing I did have to leverage is my previous education, which I had gone up to master's degree. So uh, basically leveraging that out. And I first looked at like psychology departments, mm -hmm. but the, you know, r psychology of religion, it's kind of like a pet side project for people. It's not like their main career. Uh, research, although mm -hmm. some people have gotten quite far with it, especially when you bring in clinical psychology and like mindfulness based stress reduction and basically um, harvesting um, tools from religion <laughs> and stripping the religion aspect off of them and secularizing them and presenting them to the public for mental health and that kind of clinical application has been very successful actually and also in research psychology like cognitive neuroscience has also similarly been able to get a lot from Buddhism in particular but in the Dharma traditions more generally um, but it doesn't necessarily transfer back to the practitioners of the religion right. and the traditional practice context so and it's got all kinds of social uh, implications to, um, and political implications and gender implications. So you know, it's actually a grand experiment because it's not certain how the outcome <laughs> is going to be. Um, but the fact that I um, am here means that I kind of convinced the people here that this project can be kind of fitted into a uh, perception of spiritual care and practical theology. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so basically I I'd started out looking at psychology and then finally realized that, um, and also considering also, I kind of knew from the beginning that it wasn't quite religious studies because mm -hmm. I'm really pretty familiar with most of the scholarship in the past 50 years in Buddhism in academic religious studies. Mm -hmm. And that also is basically uh, intended to be historically second person and uh, hermeneutical texts exegesis mm -hmm. and uh, translation work and critical text analysis and that kind of thing. Uh, it's not really intended and maybe is in shunned to be a first person uh, experience, mm -hmm. uh, re you know, scholarship. Um, and so finally I figured out that it was theology, that's, that's where that work has historically been done within the Western academic system. And that's when you get into a kind of this colonial divide of like the pre-colonized uh, countries who are modernized now in Asia where West Buddhism is and then the Western system. And so the Western system has the good parts of like social evolution on like gender, you know, mm -hmm. feminism and secular uh, governance in those areas, but the academic system is kind of tied up with this evolution out of the Holy Roman Empire <laughs> and the Reformation and a lot of um, divide and conquer and wealth acquisition to build up all of these huge institutions. And they're culturally rooted in those um, Western, mainly Christian traditions. Mm -hmm. But now, I mean, there are coming along, but it was hard to still even within those uh, institutions here in North America. I mean, it was actually during re retreat that I, I realized that I actually am not also a product of that system, and I also have an entitlement of sorts to it also. So and I also have that lineage of Western academic scholarship and that that is something I can bring forward to and, and you didn't leave aside right. <coughs> and there are resources to be called and also I don't need to reinvent the wheel insofar as certain things have been done in integrating um, I mean 
as much as we could say we've achieved anything in the past 200 years, especially along gender lines in religion, mm -hmm. but it's certainly come a ways. You know, it's not stable and it's nowhere uh, that we can think like, oh, our work is done. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it's sort of like we've broken through the clouds a little bit and it's a fight to hold on to whatever has been gained and there's mm -hmm. a never-ending onslaught to take away what gains have been achieved, right? I mean, yeah. we can see that now even. So, but I looked at like, okay, so where are the, core, where are the institutions in North America that have um, practical theology programs? And they themselves are quite few. Mm -hmm. uh, so looking at religious and uh, practice perspective, on a subjective practice perspective. And then those, you know, come down to under 10 or so institutions and the main, like, IV esteemed, like, seminaries and divinity schools. And of those who have any interest in a Buddhist kind of pers application, I guess you could say, never mind the perspective, but just even applying more generally beyond the Christian traditional uh, focus of most of the theologians come down to basically Emory and Claremont. It's like oh. kind of come down to, and um, Emory actually has a very good program set up in the uh, well, it's part of their uh, Chandler School of Theology, I think, mm -hmm. where it's a program to look at uh, science, psychology, and religion. But when I applied there, they sent my application directly over to the Buddhist Studies program. Oh. And um, I happened to know two of the faculty in Buddhism there, and I was able to talk to them. And they said, well, you know, actually they are interested in the, my kind of idea of, or my research interest there, but it will take maybe two years to set up a program because there aren't any Buddhist scholars in the theology school to mm -hmm. kind of like oversee it. Whereas here is like, well, yeah, they also don't have uh, people set, set up yet because it's a chicken and egg kind of scenario too. You need uh, you need the first ones. And I mean, even though there are faculty here that practice Buddhism or Buddhist meditation, even though they're ordained Christian ministers, um, it's uh, not from the scholarship so much in Buddhism as their area of uh, research expertise. Uh, but they just said, come anyway, you know, and in other words, they're pliant and flexible and willing to work it out. And I think um, even though, um, you know, maybe I'm somewhat unique in my interests here, um, the kind of defining characteristic of most of the students here at the Claremont School of Theology and the Lincoln University, I think, is that everyone does have their very unique um, research interest mm -hmm. that does not easily uh, fit anywhere else, including the faculty here. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily fit with them, but there's this kind of cultural openness of, okay, well, we're willing to work with you anyway, mm -hmm. right. and you still have to scramble like hell for the resources. So the financial aid, there's some scholarship money, but not even half of the cost. Mm -hmm. So you're on the hook for a lot of uh, student loans and you know the kind of the anxiety that goes along with that yeah. and um, yeah I think that's um, it's tough but then again it's kind of I think what people like and you must probably have a similar feeling um, being in religion and religious studies you know there's so much hardship to it no one would unless they're really driven I mean so it is kind of like that traditional we say the calling or vocation or but you know people in the arts have it too mm -hmm. right actors and creative people have this it's just it's like they almost wish they could be doing something else yeah. <laughs> themselves but it's just not gonna be and we'll go to the poor house and join uh, the suit lines and whatever if it comes down to that you know before we actually give up right and right. so it's sort of funny that way so that's how I'm here basically and so it's not always so clear how exactly it fits there's some ways in which um, Buddhist uh, my uh, interests are more actually along the lines of uh, spiritual formation uh, but I'm not really in the spiritual formation uh, program here at the theology school because it's completely from a Christian perspective and that 
background, which isn't something that I necessarily don't want to know about, but um, it's more helpful for me, a uh, practical level, to bring in the tools from the spiritual care um, disciplines into mm -hmm. Buddhism. So there's more I can kind of bring resources, I think, that I can use, whereas we, in our Buddhist uh, traditions, our resources for spiritual formation are vast right. and vastly complex, too, mm -hmm. and they're you know, almost infinitely, um, well, infinite numbers of them. So, um, you know, that's more, I mean, I think like the spiritual counseling and more of those formalized things. And then to get to the question, well, like, we, can you say that we don't have those in Buddhism? It's not exactly that, you know, that we never have had counseling, right. but not formalized in, like, hospitals, mm -hmm. because maybe there aren't any hospitals, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's like, yeah, so there is a kind of economic development. Right. Anyway, I'll let you do the question and answer now if you have, I mean, you yeah. must have prepared something, so. Yeah, we just have like a, a standard uh, set of questions that they gave us. Um, so the first one is, what religious tradition did you identify with as a child and how did it impact your childhood? I was christened uh, pre-Vatican to Roman Catholic in an Irish-Italian family, you know, fairly uh, middle class. It would probably been upper middle class if they weren't Catholic and hadn't had five children, um, the first of five. Um, well, it's actually hard to say how it's impacted because I do and did have a lot of memories of the pre-Vatican II era, which had a lot more of the bells and whistles, mm -hmm. um, the um, kind of physiological level of the uh, spiritual uh, engagement. So. Mm -hmm. It was all like the hardwood, um, pre-Vatican II. So I was probably like one to three or four years old or something like that. I didn't ever actually count out the math or anything. But um, so in those days, my mom was going to church. I mean, they were very active in the kind of Catholic way of all the uh, weekly mass kind of thing, but with the family. And she used to have like her dressed up you know, clothes for going to church. And in those days, they had to have to cover their head, mm -hmm. right? which is, of course, we know Abrahamic traditions is common. Um, and they even had, like, a small kind, which I used to think like a doily. You know, <laughs> so, there's, like, so these were, like, lace mm -hmm. uh, head coverings. And it was all, like, a lot of incense and candles, a little darker, lots of hardwood. And this is a small town church, too. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I think it's pretty typical. And um, the priests not facing the congregation and um, the altar and kneeling at the altar for communion, which you would get stuck on on your tongue, right, by the priest. So no um, mortal person would be touching that Eucharist, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, I mean, it's hard to imagine, I mean, my neurological development at that age would have been pretty much limited to that um, very um, sensual um, engagement with the world, you know, mm -hmm. so it matched pretty closely with where my neurological <laughs> experience was. And so I think it probably do did and does have a lot of influence on um, myself as a Tibetan Buddhist. And did I think of myself as Catholic? Not really so much, but I did think of myself as very spiritual. And my family went through the transition to post-Vatican II, which is this kind of reform and renewal movement and bringing especially the lay people into the um, program development of the church programs. I think I helped out as a Sunday school teacher, but I did start meditating at this young age before having too many other influences from other religions. So it was about maybe between, well, seven or eight years old, and it's something I 
just kept up throughout my teen years of just... Was it a Catholic form of meditation? No, it was my own do-it-yourself Zen kind of thing. I mean, if you were going to classify it in a Christian terms, you'd probably say Baptist, extemporaneous uh, nature mysticism of sorts. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I would just go out on my own, but it was on my own initiative and no one suggested me to do it. That's how I know it was coming from somewhere else, you know, coming from my own, uh, because it wasn't coming from somewhere else. I would just literally pick up, I had like, so at the earliest ages, I didn't go so far from home, but across the street from my house, there was a like, cornfield, mm -hmm. and at the back side of it, there was... Out on its own, a little pussy willow tree, and that was like my favorite place to go hang out. And I would just sit there and basically commune. Sometimes I'd lie down, and I'm, so I think I had the conception of communing with God, but very much a nature mysticism kind of level. Which, if you read any Ken Wilber, uh, well, I will recommend you to read some Ken Wilber because there's a debate that he um, takes on about how spiritually advanced nature mysticism can or cannot be, and um, that'll leave the discussion about that on, but let's say that I was just in, you know, in my, like, eight or eight-year-old mind, um, yeah, I wasn't really questioning any ontological thing, but I, so probably the theological, I'd been through Baltimore Catechism, and um, so the next thing that come is in part of my youthful influence is um, that I had friends in school who belonged to United Church of Christ, and they had a Pilgrim's Fellowship Youth Club, and so I started going to the youth club, even though I wasn't a member of their church. I might have sat in on some or one or another church program, but I did go to the summer camp. Mm -hmm belonging to that. So that's actually in Sharon, Connecticut. It's called um, Silver Lake. And I've been on the web. I haven't been back to the actual location um, recently, but um, I did look at the website and actually how large percentage that they have it's counted of people like alumni who went to that Silver Lake like youth camps mm -hmm. um, did become like clergy and <laughs> full-time kind of uh, people. So that's an interesting outcome, and the, um, so basically it was this sort of New England congregational transcendentalist kind of um, culture, um, but still kind of reinforced through that kind of old school colonial kind of era, to aura, I should say, right? Um, both work. I mean, so they have sort of some respectability because of being old, and like you can associate them with the kind of. Uh, early America mm -hmm. of New England, and it was in New England. So, anyway, though, they have a summer kind of camp which had like activities for kids that most c summer camps do. Not a lot of, you know, directly imposed kind of, um, ca uh, what's it, catechism to it, but kind of a spiritually open thing. And so there would be like a morning chapel thing. Um, event that was outdoors in like the mountainside and so um, and then there might be some like some spiritual reflection to it so not a heavy duty top down kind of thing but a very grassroots and organic type of spirituality and so a little reflection and I mean it had other weird issues with it relative to it being in the 70s, I mean, probably with counselors were smoking dope and, you know, who knows what, but, um, uh, it, but it was, that was not a dominant feature, mm -hmm. and in fact, what stood out in the 70s when there was so much um, nastiness in the world at the time, we had, you know, the um, Cold War going on, and um, Europe, we have the missiles, millions of missiles, and this kind of thing affected me very strongly. And saturated with drugs, the society, and this huge gaps of communication with youth. So the um, Pilgrim's Fellowship really stood out as really the only people around that were interested in us as youth, you know, to just let us be what we are not trying to force us into something else. And so it was a really open place, and I credit them 
you know, for really having that um, kind of attitude to youth and um, welcoming the youth from where they were and not trying to impose something on them. You know? yeah. So it was so very open. And I ended up continuing going back a little bit to that. I did a couple of like weekend like writers reflection camp kind of retreats with them in more high school level. And also though, um, so around that same time I guess, it was before I was 16, well there was a lot of influence in the culture, in um, the market, like in the fashions, we had a lot of our shirts, I guess it came out of post-Vietnam era, Vietnam area, era um, like wearing um, clothes from India, you know, like the printed shirts, mostly denim pants, where we wear, but there was some, you know, kind of an idea of Asia from that, and then my mom's friend, her husband was from Kerala in South India, and so I had an influence from him, and I think he had been taking a TN course, but they were Catholic, and they were also members of the same spiritual community as my parents, and they went through a um, uh, marriage encounter, which was a kind of reflection retreat kind of thing, to also spiritually reflect on their relationships as married people, but uh, a lot of my mom and dad's friends uh, went through the same program together and so they developed a kind of community within their Catholic church, mm -hmm. um, like kind of a subculture you would say. And um, so I actually, I know I was under 16 because I had to get relative, my mom to take me, but I went out of Connecticut to Massachusetts to take um, I guess it was a form of initiation. Probably I was just handing them over money or not. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it's hard to remember exactly. Uh, but I did get um, trained a little bit in TM, Transcendental Meditation. And so it was a young age. And so I was very interested, but there was not very much going on culturally as far as no internet to connect. I did go to a couple practice sessions maybe to a, in a town that was more nearer to my home. But the approach was, I don't know if it was, you know, inherent to the Transcendental Meditation program or whether it was just in the way that it had finally come from India to suburbia USA that it lost something. But the people said, like, well, the mantras were so secret, even they couldn't explain them. Well, of course, probably none of them were Sanskrit scholars and knew what they meant. But for me, not having any kind of um, context for these mantras, the practice didn't really stick as such. But looking back, I know that a lot of my concerns as hypersensitive about the suffering in the world and the political structures of suffering and the social structures, economic structures, and like none of it being really on the curriculum or even the minds of either my peers or the adults in my world. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think I was probably a pretty depressed teenager overall because I took these things very seriously and no one else seemed to really. And I mean, I understand people, it's kind of futile in a way to worry about these things. But um, that is, I think, a foreshadowing of my Buddhist kind of uh, a sense. So I think, you know, if it, things like now compared to then, uh, I would be um, in touch with Buddhism as a 16-year-old if I was in a remote American suburb today versus in the 70s and would have probably connected to something out there that... So because um, when I did actually, I mean, there's, I'm skipping some time now, but um, when I did actually meet my first Tibetan Buddhist teacher, which was in... 1987 or 1988, I think it was, 1988, um, in May, um, then that's when um, I found the culture to be a completely different perspective on suffering, which was that 
Oh, uh, well, we don't consider it pathological for you to be hypersensitive about suffering in the world. Rather, we think it's pathological for people not to be sensitive to the suffering in the world. So, that's where I found my home in there, you know, and then it changes the outlook of kind of internalizing that kind of um, condition. But that is, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a tricky theological question because, you know, you can get into the kind of chosen one mentality too, but uh, it's not, uh, Tibetan Buddhism is not really uh, proselytizing. Anyway, that's a long kind of answer, okay. but uh, covers a lot of uh, time. Yeah. So were you still uh, practicing Catholicism through this? Through the um, no, I actually got into a bit of trouble in middle school because of um, nascent feminist awakening and not um, really wanting to do the home economics course that they had gender segregated so that guys would do a wood shop and the girls would do a home ec class and basically the class um, was trying to force us to learn to sew and I mean it's not really the fault of the woman who was teaching the course because you know, it was beyond her like she wasn't maybe designing the whole curriculum of the school right. But it wasn't even that they were asking us to learn to sew, to like make a cover for my bike or something like that. They were, we were supposed to sew an apron and I just rebelled against this and I'm glad that I did. But, you know, it's interesting because I really didn't connect the dots at that time. Do you know, I just could, like, smell the bad odor around it. And, I mean, now I can see that is so, um, so subtle but also overt at the same time mm -hmm. of um, brainwashing. And unfortunately, you know, it was a small town, and I mean, I, anyway, the long story short was I was asked not to come back to middle school for eighth grade. Oh, now, wow. it turns out, you know, and unfortunately my parents are probably more on the conservative side, you know, that if I'm having trouble, I must be the one who's something wrong and um, not the school. But I think there were some people around the country who were going through the same thing whose parents were like lawyers and had a more mentality of um, fighting on behalf of their kids. So I'm sure there were lots of lawsuits filed because really um, within years we had Title IX passed. You know, by well, the time I was um, at the end of my freshman year of high school um, we had Title IX passed, which if you don't know Title IX, yeah, you did some, you're not in your head, which is good. But a lot of people don't, you know, and they don't realize that this is so recent that uh, women, you know, were not allowed to even play full court basketball in high school just like 30 years ago. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's kind of scary when you think about it. But um, anyway, so I went to Catholic school for the eighth grade, and I actually did better at um, Catholic school than I did in the public middle school as far as my academics and I think as far as my social cultural behavior I did hang out with um, another kind of kid who was um, in the I mean was, I had to go to the next town and it was really traumatic to kind of leave the social network of an adolescent kind of thing but it was also a pretty um, negative, uh, you know, environment too. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was so much alienation between the students, between each other and the teachers, and I, I mean alienation just culturally so out of touch with each other, so unfamiliar with each other's universes culturally. Mm -hmm. It's not to say it doesn't happen today, but I think there's more formal mechanisms to engage or attempt to engage students so if there was like a trauma, like, you know, um, in the United States, if there's a shooting somewhere, you know, the um, teachers are more likely to like bring it up to the students in class mm -hmm. and actually invite their opinion. But when I was in school in the 70s, like Vietnam, they never, no one talked about the fact that you saw 
I mean, they just probably thought we were too young and innocent and not to, you know, worry us with such serious matters kind of thing. But they didn't realize that we were taking it in anyway. And that they're just like undermining their credit, you know, credibility by, you know, pretending this whole alternate universe doesn't exist. So I did have experience of Catholicism, and I did to go through a confirmation ceremony and took Joan of Arc as my like <laughs> confirmation saint, and then I pretty much was off on my own. Um, yeah, I was more into consciousness exploration, and I did hang out. Um, yeah, it was the late '70s, rock and roll culture. And um, I did pretty good. I was, I was still much kind of like a seeker. And I did have a sense of renunciation from a young age, meaning like while my um, peers, even though we'd go to parties and drinking and smoking and hanging out, I did have a sense where like for one time I s actually stopped taking alcohol at keg parties. And... Um, brought like a two liter bottle of soda for my own drink and it was interesting I remember now you know because I w it wasn't just because I was feeling like I was having a problem with alcohol because I mean I, I didn't have that sense even though I probably did have a problem with alcohol <laughs> and that's how I know right. I mean because I even uh, but I really ran it as an experiment to see like how would my subjective experience of the party go you know so I had this mentality that other of my peers didn't share and I also had a sense as a high school student that um, kind of the rat race uh, assessment you know that also no one else and so I under I even verbalized to as I had decided that I was not going to go um, into any kind of higher education immediately after high school that I had to travel the world and understand how the world how people are outside of the United States and that I wasn't getting that information elsewhere and I hadn't um, been enthusiastic with any one subject in school enough to make an investment of like college education even though I did do kind of like a college preparatory curriculum in the high school so, um, but I remember very clearly saying to myself and other people that um, I would go through four or five years of college and then be in um, some nine to five job and what for, you know, where was I going to go with it? And I didn't have a sense of why it would be meaningful. Um, and then just having a, f a family, I hadn't quite like um, found the, my own interest in that. You know, and so then I did travel overseas. So um, basically, I, to answer the question, is that I veered off into my own spirituality that was pretty much I mean, has all the signs of a monastic, but without the uh, religious support for it, which I'm still kind of fighting that battle, as you can see. Um, but in hindsight, in hindsight, it's hard not to wonder that if there had been women priests in the Catholic priesthood, if I might not have been interested in that room, you know. And I mean, I'm pretty clear on remembering not being intrigued to follow the Catholic nuns route. And I remember very clearly what their role had been in the whole establishment. Now, of course, I know politically and socially, well, I mean, actually, I could have probably found a home in like the liberation theology side, but um, anyway, if there were women saying mass, things could turn out differently, let me just put it that way. I'm not, it's, hard, it's easy to say it in hindsight, and, um, but, and theologically there are a lot of connections that I can make. I don't know that I would have the same insights, however, if I stayed in Catholicism, about Catholicism that I have from Vajrayana Buddhism. So I can I feel like I understand <laughs> Catholic theology a lot better than um, yeah I wonder if maybe they have it we won't know yeah. we, until you know, maybe one day. Um, okay, so the next one is: Is your tradition the same today that you had been growing up? If so, why as a woman, why as a woman has your tradition remained an important part of your life? If not, 
what was your tradition and why did you change? So we kind of talked about that. We did yeah. talk about that. The only thing I think it would be worth mentioning is that I have seen the same gender issues in every religion, including my adopted religion, or mm -hmm. what you could say. So I think, um, having heard so far, you know, there's already a trend. You mm -hmm. can see from an early age towards a Buddhist um, spiritual home. And um, so we don't have the same exact issues as far as uh, priests, function goes. Uh, anyone can be a priest in Vajrayana Buddhism who um, goes through the formal training of the liturgical experience and uh, ritual experience and you know the study to know what those mean. Um, however, there are ordination issues like women's um, lineages of fully ordained women in Buddhism got basically lost or died out in two of the three um, traditions of Buddhism that had it, so that only one now exists in the world. Um, and so if you're in one of the other two and trying to get full ordination, there's kind of a battleground as far as people being either for or against it or not quite understanding what it about or why it has any value or not. And then there's the social, cultural um, influences from having gender imbalances, but they're not really theologically based. Nevertheless, you see the same patterns of the um, misogynist kind of mm, characters who've popped up over the millennia mm -hmm. in their writings that, you know, they leave a wake that always seems to last a several centuries. And um, so it's like it never quite goes away. But it's also, fortunately in Buddhism, um, there's a long history of um, people having caught the whiff of that dualistic gender divide and kind of um, explicitly approaching it in liturgy and in scripture so that we have going back to pre-Mahayana and Theravada scriptures and Mahayana scriptures. There's also, alongside like the um, male superiority kind of um, lobby, mm -hmm. there's always been somebody kind of calling them out on it too. So, um, yeah, that kind of mirrors human nature and human evolution. So that's the only thing I could add. Uh, but on the other hand, you could be a fully functioning priest mm -hmm. and perform your rituals. And in that sense, there's not even the kind of issue you have in Buddhism that you have in Christianity between um, like the Latin Romist, what do they call the Romist Popist <laughs> church and the Reformed churches of having to have a mediator. You know, I don't. Uh, on the other hand, though, there's still uh, the culture of uh, priestly uh, occupations and vocations and their social status that goes along with it. So actually, we have all. <laughs> but you can be, you can still be a functioning priest as a lay woman in Buddhism, provided you've gone through the training to be it. And so it's separated from ordination status as a monastic. Um, so, the third one is, how has your religion impacted your educational development? Um, it's had a great impact. I've never seen the two as separate because my um, undergraduate interests, well, even before undergraduate interests, were all very tied up with my interests in ontological <laughs> status of reality. So I first got interested in computing and computers and lasers and then got interested in physics. And um, I went directly towards um, grand unified theories and theoretical uh, higher energy physics and particle physics. That's what got me interested in studying physics in college. Mm -hmm. And then so... Um, it's very similar in the kind of headspace 
that you feel subjectively to um, metaphysical kind of contemplation or actually um, considering particle physics and it, it comes down to basically the same notion that reality as it's given in the ken of um, perceptive awareness is not necessarily the whole story and um, if you look deeper you can find all kinds of interesting things going on so um, and then uh, on the other hand um, when I was doing my freshman year of physics because I hadn't actually done physics in high school so I was coming in having traveled uh, mainly in London I didn't get around the world as I'd hoped, but um, I did um, not have the same academic preparation as most freshmen in physics have, so it was a real um, crash course for me to learn like vector math and to even just to do freshman mechanics. Of physics, I had to. So it was very intensive. Is so that by the um, spring semester of my first year of my undergrad program, I knew I wanted to go for a retreat, you know, just to take a rest. And I did take a course in Indian philosophy that year. That um, the professor's wife was friends with Ramdas and it invited Ramdas on campus. So that's who I did my first real. Uh, substantial meditation with is uh, 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 Guru Ramdas. Yeah, it's a funny, it's a funny tale. So yeah, it helped me narrow my thoughts to get a short answer to your question. But it turns out it's an interesting answer because I studied with. Um, so I had this uh, very nice meditation with Ramdas and. Um, looking around um, for a place to do some retreat, you know, it's very similar to how it is now in North America as most of those um, programs are targeted at the upper income earner, let's put it politely. Um, and so as a student, you know, I'm basically the only place I could find that would accommodate a student kind of work study scenario was Milarepa Center in Vermont, which is founded by students of uh, Lame Tupdin Yeshe and Zopa Rinpoche, Tupdin Zopa. And they founded this um, religious organization called Foundation for the Preservation of the Mahayana Tradition, which is a kind of mouthful of 70s. Anyway, most people call it FPMT. And um, basically founded in Nepal by Western students who had drifted into Nepal, basically escaping kind of Western society during the Vietnam era and kind of, um, you know, just the culture of Europe to take years off. Um, to explore oneself a little bit too. They're so wise in Europe compared to Americans to let their youth do that and not have to spend the whole of adult life really in midlife crisis, right? So they kind of got ahead of. Um, in Kathmandu, basically, had met, the students had met um, these teachers of Tibetan Buddhism and um, developed together a Kopan monastery in Kathmandu and they had like yearly courses there and so one of the students Peter Baker had based, had this land up in Vermont and had offered it to his teacher in Lama Yeshe and then in turn Zabrun Shea and students have been running is still there now and so when I arrived there the same weekend my first Geshe teacher, Geshe Lobsang Jampa, had been just coming in to America for the first time from Nepal and India where he had been and was actually staying to kind of acclimatize at St. Michael's College which is a Catholic, uh, a place for Catholic fathers, um, priests, it was a college, like a seminary. And so he was visiting from the weekend from that Catholic college, but eventually was going to be a resident teacher at the Milarepa Center. So we hit it off immediately, and then I was his student for the years. But as far as my educational influence goes, I continued in physics. My first teacher, Geshe Jampa, was very strong about 
um, I, that I not abandon my um, university studies to study Buddhism full time or to go off on a pilgrim of Asia, pilgrimage of Asia, or become what we kind of call the Dharma bum and slosh around and with my religious and spiritual interests, uh, but to complete my program. And so I actually had um, a long but, well, it's actually brief but deep relationship with Geshe Champa insofar as I would travel from Boston up to Vermont while I was teaching there and eventually he moved down to teach as a resident teacher in a new um, FPMT center there called Kurukula Center, which is also still there. And um, But Geshe Jamba soon after that was diagnosed with cancer, like a pancreatic cancer or something like that. And I was one of his assistants and near, living nearby. So when you are learning meditation in the class, you know, with any meditation teacher, it's pretty a comfortable environment. I mean, if you want to figure out and uh, get your body to sit comfortably on a cushion or a chair or whatever. Um, then you will talk about the standard kind of introductory topics like contemplation of impermanence and uh, inevitability of death and having this you know, daily awareness to make my life most meaningful and kind of a rationale for the whole Buddhist path. Um, but when someone is actually dying, you know, <laughs> it has a little bit different, you know, so it's, a, it's a easy to kind of have false sense of security. Well, death is, you know, it's good to think about, but here I am in my comfortable thing. But of course, every congregation has someone with sickness and death, and it, that's the nature, but I mean, still, the point is it was a very direct um, instruction mm -hmm. on death and dying that I received from my first teacher. And... Um, he actually did die um, in um, 1991 in the um, spring, right when I was doing my um, final exams in electromagnetic theory and some very f kind of abstract, very heady uh, physics courses. And it was very surreal because in Tibetan Buddhism, you know, we don't disturb the body of the person who dies until, you know, there's confidence that there actually is a death. That, I think, comes from a pre-modern mm -hmm. context before the advent of modern medical equipment, you know, so mm -hmm. you don't uh, bury or burn people <laughs> who are not really fully dead. Um, so... We were actually with Geshe Jampa day and night for like three days and three nights in the same room with him and his body. And I was also helping um, wrap his body up and cremating. And uh, so that was a whole process and completely surreal and had a big influence on me as far as like, well, I felt like he gave a lot. He was out of his home country in Tibet and in India where his peers were to teach us Buddhism. And so I think I was on the subway from uh, there to my university program where I kind of had this kind of insight, well, you know, I can take his legacy and go basically three ways with it. It was like, uh, let it completely deteriorate and try to sustain it or try to increase it. And so I think I made some kind of commitment to myself to do the most with it as possible. And then, uh, as part of his kind of funeral um, rituals that we did with him, a Gesh, another late Geshe Kemrab who was in Montreal had come down to oversee those. And in order to actually um, participate in some of the liturgical practices, we're actually supposed to have done some of the preliminary training for those. And so Geshe Kenrev had said, well, as long as I had gone on the retreat, which he would do that summer, then I could stay and participate. So the summer after Geshe Jampa died, then I um, did this one-month retreat in um, one of our practices in Tibetan Buddhism called Vajrayogini. And it had a very powerful impact on me. And I did go to Nepal that year and did end up getting 
ordained as a nun and um, actually was ordained in South India, a Tibetan refugee camp monastery down there. And, but I, I returned uh, to complete my senior year of my university program and then uh, had the idea to teach science to Tibetan Buddhist monks and then went on to do my master's degree at Harvard Graduate School of Education in teaching and curriculum of science. But what is kind of funny about it is that um, you may know that Harvard Graduate School of Education is where Ramdas and Tim Leary were in the 60s. And I didn't really appreciate this until I was in my retreats before I came back to the United States. But I see myself um, also as having kind of this little Western lineage, too, that comes out. And while I was at Harvard, I did study Tibetan. And at the time, it was, I think, called the School of Sanskrit and Indian Studies, mm -hmm. which um, I was telling you before I knew the faculty in Buddhism at Emory. Well, they were doctoral students then at Harvard. <laughs> That's how I know them. Yeah, so it's kind of a funny world, right? So and, and so it's been hand in hand, and um, it was out of my contemplative retreat practice, as I mentioned earlier, that I got inspired to come back to the United States after 20 years away and um, pursue my doctorate, especially mm -hmm. in contemplative research of Vajrayana practice, but especially for the benefit of um, teachers and students of the tradition and within that traditional context, of religious context. Yeah. So a long answer again, sorry about no, that. I, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so uh, the next one is how has religion impacted the direction of your adult life? So. <laughs> uh, yes, it's almost self-explanatory, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, it, it's had a huge impact. I'm a monastic, I'm in a religious tradition that is not yet well represented in the United States. There's not a monastic infrastructure here yet to support me, so, um, uh, or anyone else for that matter to do much retreat practice. There's a little bit here and there. Um, and for myself personally, that is part of why I'm back doing my doctorate, is so that I can hopefully uh, get a teaching job that might even, within the university system, have a salary which I can use to actually start doing some of the um, infrastructure building that we need as far as actual nuts and bolts resources, mm -hmm. uh, especially for young people. So I'm kind of seeing where, I'm seeing myself as a teenager, uh, you know, uh, a lone Buddhist mentality uh, or personality in this landscape with no other Buddhists around and really kind of internalizing that and, um, you know, wanting to have something more um, for the future generations and present, not necessarily that they would be Buddhist, but just to looking out at the society and the um, state of affairs of humanity and the ecosystem and the world of the whole and seeing how impacted young people must be by that and where did they get to go to reflect on it and not really having a lot of resources there for them to, uh, I mean, but they've got their um, mobile phones and internet which is something, but even virtual spaces, not a lot yet targeted. Um, so, I, uh, yeah, I'm ho it's very much an um, um, influence on me. And also, I am also very much, um, um, uh, I hate to say the word, but I want to almost say victim of that uh, predicament too, insofar as. Um, I have uh, probably now my second year of coursework looking at $50,000 of student loan debt 
and wondering, like, will I be able to stay in Southern California to do my qualifying exam papers and my dissertation work? Oh, and if even if that makes sense to do that, would I be able to pay the rent? And if so, from whence the money would come? And so there's a way in which even now in my second year, the chaos of having fully moved in from 20 years in Asia, that culture shock, just as it's starting to wear off, I'm feeling like I may not have that much traction here because... And so... And my own um, social support or spiritual, social spiritual resources for my own um, security or what have you, or even to teach Buddhism too. Similarly, um, I'm finding it, you know, precarious and very tentative to actually have a notion of putting a foothold anywhere. But then, of course, from a Buddhist point of view, like Pema Chodron, she would say, well, that's all an illusion anyway. But, um, but here I am, you know, with this kind of mission of kind of um, getting a hook somewhere into the material plane and the cultural plane of my own culture as an American-born person. And at the same time, the whole social battle is about precisely that. You know, the whole war on war, the war on social security, so-called entitlements, which people have paid into as part of their compensation packages. I mean, that's all what it comes down to, is who's going to have a foothold anywhere, right? So um, it's part of the human condition, but it does raise a lot of quandaries. Well, do you have a teacher here in America that you have access to? Um, ma, I do have a new teacher who is in Arizona. However, my um, main practice now um, is developing and or what I'm pursuing mostly is in Drupa Kagyu lineage, which <laughs> paradoxically does not have anything <laughs> established in North America yet. So His Holiness Gyalwam Drupa, I did see him last week, I had to fly to New York, he was in New York for a United Nations program, he's a very socially engaged, um, I even like to think of him, um, and although I still have to develop it um, from a scholarly perspective, but um, as our first Tibetan Buddhist eco-feminist. So, I put this video uh, interview up <laughs> in the public domain, then um, let it be known I might be the first to proclaim it in the open airways <laughs> that uh, His Holiness Gelon Drupa might be the first uh, Tibetan Buddhist, or maybe any Buddhist. No, that's not quite true. But, anyways, it's a um, notion I'm pursuing in my third world feminist uh, theology course with um, the esteemed Rosemary Ruther. Um, so uh, that's a slightly different lineage. I actually, I'm a student of His Holiness of Dalai Lama. Most of my um, practices which I've done in my retreat um, experience were from him. And then, of course, I mentioned earlier FPMT, uh, Lama Zopa Rinpoche, and late Geshe Jampa. Um, they had the most, and I have some uh, other influences, but as far as who's on hand as a practical matter, well, there are some nearby places that I've just started to kind of find out where they are and visit once or twice, mm -hmm. and I can go back and visit them. Yeah, but one I found in Temple City, uh, Drikinkagyu, I actually did um, get a connection from a visiting uh, clergy there, but he's usually, I think, stationed in Arizona and a little bit in Chicago area. But yes, so it's coming along, but as I mentioned, just as I feel like I might be making some connections, uh, it's all looking more tentative. And then there's a way in which, even though we always want to live and um, almost take a refuge in the uncertainty aspect of reality and um, as almost the insurance against the false sense of security that is easy to um, project 
on the outer world that is not necessarily there. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, uh, Buddhists, uh, we are all about cause and effect and self-authoring, you know, so you're creator, you are the master of your universe too in a certain degree. So if I want to be here or not, or want to be elsewhere, then, you know, should I be like throwing the seeds mm -hmm. in the land? So I'm still, yeah, I have the... I'm sharing the students uh, and young, you know, human condition with all, everyone else. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, let's see. What role have you played in shaping the religious beliefs of your family? I think I've had a pretty influential role. It was uh, people ask me all the time how my family managed with me being Buddhist and um, a monastic, I'm a nun. And um, actually, my mom's sister had been a Catholic nun for a short while, and um, so there is a history in my family of having monastics. Um, that whole monastic culture, it would have actually probably been more to my benefit if um, there had been more monastic culture <laughs> in the family, because um, people who, like even Irish Italians, who are used to having uh, monastics or clergy around, they kind of get it, that kind of um, lifestyle more. So, uh, but I think they all, I mean, my sister came to visit me in Kumbu in Mount Everest National Park where my hermitage is. She came twice, once, first time with her husband and the second time with my mom and her four-year-old son. And, um, so interest in Nepal. My mom probably very more, maybe more outwardly or inter internally. Um, I think everyone knows about Buddhism a lot more than they would ever. Uh, on the other hand, when there's a family um, gathering happening, I'm probably the only one who really feels not so comfortable, meaning like I don't really get the same kick of, you know, barbecue or the, you know, beer drinking and cocktails and food, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, um, this is like, well, I guess what we call in, um, like, yoga uh, culture, low down on the chakra totem pole, <laughs> you know, and so it's hard, I mean, I can understand in a way that people like to stay on the mundane plane as a break mm -hmm. from the challenges of daily life, and I'm starting to get that. But at the level of my own participation, I mean, I, I found the best non-alcoholic beer I can find is Klaus Taylor. I usually drink a Klaus Taylor. Everyone's used to me being vegetarian, so that's not really such a big deal either. But I don't know that I enjoy sitting around drinking and chit-chatting about these mundane things. Um, as much as everyone else does. But when we get actually onto like playing games or when we have uh, events that are more nature focused like uh, outdoors trekking or something like that, then it works well. So, but then <laughs> so there hasn't been any major conflicts or anything like No that? major conflicts. I'd say the conflict era was before I um, embarked on my monastic path as a teenager feeling very trapped in the culture and not feeling at home in it and not really finding an identity for myself and I think it must be very similar to um, LGBTQI kind of um, identity crisis and it's even weirder because like celibacy you know we're not really in the spectrum mm -hmm. of the sexual gender identity um, crisis, just like Buddhists are not included in the atheist debate either, you know, it's like, yeah, so I don't know, maybe a therapist would say I self-select these uh, roles of, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, alienation or something, anyway, I'll have to look into it. Um, okay, uh, what is your relationship with and how do you define your role in your religious community? Um, it's hard to, s can you repeat the first part again? Yeah. What is your relationship with, and how do you define your role in your religious community? Um, I have a role basically as one of the pioneers, is how I define it, 
Um, within the Asian context, I'm a pioneer as a uh, female practitioner, scholar, contemplative. Um, I, I'm not using the word yogi, but just because it's so cliche, um, I don't use it so much. But some people, you know, I mean, actually, uh, that's part of the battleground, you could say. You know, historically, female contemplatives who've done the amount of practice that male counterparts would be given very esteemed titles for mm -hmm. typically are not given those titles right. just because it's not part of the high expectations which uh, the lack of those high expectations goes hand in hand with kind of a malaise in gender relations and the culture historically and um, so uh, I found uh, my spiritual um, challenge to be now, as I mentioned before, in Drupa Kagyu because um, at the spiritual level I can take my previous practice in Vajrayana Buddhism with Nyingma and Geluk, practices from His Holiness, Dalai Lama and I had Daklan Setro Rinpoche and Tenbeche Rinpoche influence on the Nyingma side. And His Holiness Gyalong Drupa has um, his Drupa Kagyu and Nyingma um, background influences. And so at a liturgical level, I can advance my own spiritual practice in that tradition. And um, also, he and the culture of that tradition is a socially engaged one and a gender-friendly <laughs> one. And as I might even say, womanist, if not feminist, um, I don't know how they call themselves, but definitely uh, I think we can infer mm -hmm. from statements um, publicly made, but not necessarily called into a document that... So I feel like I might be the one may, probably to make one of those documents soon uh, because I have that context now in the university. I have the actual course assignments to make such documents. I don't have to choose that. Uh, whether that tradition from the inside sees me as one of their representatives or not, well, um, Yes, to a certain extent, but no, probably to a certain extent too. But um, if I um, work hard and I do have some kind of commitment to try, and because I mentioned earlier, there isn't much um, in the way of Drupa Kagyu uh, presence in North America in the religious point of view, uh, the humanitarian social engagement, the nonprofit organization has a very good profile here and a high profile here in the culture, but um, the religious part is still just coming along, and I met last, last weekend the counterparts in New York, and uh, so I see myself coming out, but I'm limited insofar as my own personal resources in um, developing that, but if I can hurry up and get my doctorate and get a salaried position, things will move along a lot faster, I think. Right. So I, still, I see myself as one of those early monastics who brought Buddhism into other territories, and it took their whole lifetimes to move things even a inch, mm -hmm. you know, basically. But I've come from the perspective of making myself go through the traditional training before, you know, so that I have my own personal experience, such as it is, um, you know, to share from and rather, you know, so it's something more organic. Yeah. Um, okay, the last one is, uh, how do you think you have participated in shaping your religious tradition? Um, it's a work in progress. It's still, um, you know, the Tibetan Buddhist uh, culture is diverse and vast and covers everything from Mongolia and uh, Tibetan Plateau to the Himalayas and from Ladakh through Nepal, Bhutan and uh, Northeast India and um, Dharamsala and the Tibetan refugee settlements across India and um, East Asia, including Taiwan, Hong Kong, um, China, and Japan, Korea, and then internationally, 
And so within that geographical expanse, there's a huge diversity of social and educational and um, practice as far as religious education goes or religious practice goes. So um, in other words, probably the areas that I see myself most embedded in is from a, what I would like to see as far as resources here in North America for someone like myself, say 20 years younger, is the contemplative piece, a re, you know, place uh, like a hermitage where you can go for shorter, longer retreats, and but um, having female self-sufficiency and female um, self-organized, but not necessarily opposed to mm -hmm. male things. And I think that's an area that is not necessarily a priority for people like mm, in certain parts of the Himalayas or Mongolia. I think His Holiness Gyalim Drupa's tradition in, across the Himalayas uh, is not a necessarily a recent thing because I think it comes out of the culture of his monastery and the tradition of Drupa Kagyu in Darjeeling and his previous teachers there was kind of like a cultural intellectual hotbed uh, so very kind of reform minded and so it had that kind of Berkeley <laughs> kind of vibe to it of Tibetan culture and Indian intellectual and then of course had the Jesuits and the um, Christian schools there so high standard of education also um, but anyway, let's just say in Tibetan society, that's still the, the what we would call the learning edge in um, psycho-spiritual uh, talk, <laughs> California talk. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, pioneering, but not necessarily, no one's necessarily considering me to be representing them. And then that's fair enough, you know, I think that's part of the feminist um, ground staking process too, you know, I mean, um, yeah. Um, well, is there anything else that you would like to add or that you think I've missed or anything like that? Um, I feel it's been a pretty good interview and um, um, let's see, I think maybe I could just reflect on one more point maybe, which is not necessarily uh, so pertinent to your questions, but it does kind of frame up like where I'm at with things mm -hmm. now, um, especially in our Vajrayana Buddhist tradition, but I think you can even make the case for any religion. There are ways that in order for those religious traditions to be effective, in a social cultural way that they can actually meet people wherever they happen to be developmentally speaking and I mean in spiritual psych, you know holistic development let's say so taking kind of holistic perspective so that means that you can approach the theology at a very naive level and take everything exactly as it's presented at a pure symbolic level and but not even looking at them as symbols you know as a realistic in which case you say okay well these are idols <coughs> they're real or how what have you and then in another level is um, at a more um, abstract conceptual level and as their as representative of other ideals and things we might aspire towards or ontological ways of uh, looking at the world and so also epistemologically mm -hmm. um, a lot different and whether one has a literacy or uh, methods of actually reading into the historical literature of the theology or not can the religion actually function for both parties, you know, who are not taking that kind of uh, academic approach or philosophical approach and looking at what has been said in the past millennia about the meaning of things that the symbols represent. 
And over the millennia, there's always been this broad spectrum of people's approach to the religion. Mm -hmm. So um, we had in uh, ancient India, uh, India, where our Vajrayana tradition is very rich, especially influenced from like time of Christ through the first millennia, okay, the first thousand years, very rich. And most of the impact that we have in the scriptural recording is from like the Brahmin pandits who were Buddhist, but they were Brahmins. So they would have been literate in Sanskrit even before they joined a monastic institution. And those monastic institutions would have had other Buddhists who weren't Brahmins or from um, such learned backgrounds uh, who might have been running the kitchens. And um, we know in like um, Chan, Zen Buddhism, uh, like Huineng, the sixth patriarch of Zen, was uh, actually had been found uh, from the kitchen. And there was a tradition that t was taken up in Zen Buddhism <laughs> of the naming part patriarchs from the kitchen staff, uh, which speaks something to this <laughs> point I'm making, you know. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that what I see myself doing in my academic role and scholarly role is uh, speaking to the symbols and the meaning behind the symbols in a contemporary way because the uh, traditional uh, modes of speaking about them are in using a mythic language. And so it's easy for a contemporary scholar to dismiss the whole system just because they can't see the mythic language as a language. And once you understand that it is a language and it has a syntax and lexicon of its own, um, and you can actually find scriptural evidence of that being used to actually convey post-formal abstract um, ideas that evidence the fact that they weren't used that way at a very naive level mm -hmm. um, that you know there's a whole nother message um, that and that those traditions can convey and I think that they're appreciated even intuitively by people who are attracted to those traditions and yet in the academic world we see little room for people to do that kind of work <laughs> And so I'm ending on this point. I'm staking out my ground and hoping, you know, uh, yeah, all goes well. And thank you for inviting me for the interview. Thank you for taking the time. And I appreciated it. It was great. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um.